My name is Christopher Ryan. I have a PhD in psychology. My dissertation was about uh, human sexual behavior in prehistory. And I co-authored uh, the New York Times bestseller, Sex at Dawn, with my wife, uh, Casilda Jetta, who's a Mozambican psychiatrist. And um, so one of the major projects of the book is to uh, look at our prehistorical roots uh, and, 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 and look at what they might say about uh, our current practices and sexuality. Right. Can you just give us a little brief overview of Sure. Uh, essentially, one time I was at a conference when I was working on my dissertation and um, a guy at breakfast, I think it was a German scientist of some sort, asked me what I was working on. I said, uh, well, I'm doing research on human sexual behavior in prehistory. And he scoffed. He had a mouthful of scone at the time he scoffed and the scone flew all over the table. And he said, well, what do you do? You, you go to sleep and dream? In other words, he said, there's, there's no source of data. Well, it turns out there are a lot of different sources of data on human sexual behavior in prehistory. What we look at in the book are four primary uh, data sources. One is primatology, particularly the primates that are most closely related to human beings, specifically the bonobos and chimps, and to a lesser extent, gorillas um, and apes in general. And uh, we look at anthropology, specifically uh, focusing on societies that live more or less the way our ancestors did as uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers, immediate return hunter-gatherers. So they don't accumulate resources, they don't live in settled villages, they're nomadic. There are some of them in existence and we also look at uh, first contact accounts from travelers and explorers who met with these people, missionaries and so on. Uh, we also look at contemporary psychosexual research, what sorts of issues people have with sexuality, what sorts of pornography they're into, what sorts of uh, recurring problems couples come to counselors with, that sort of thing. And the last uh, very interesting uh, and important source of information is human anatomy. Because it turns out that a biologist can read an animal's body uh, like you can read a book. There's so much information written in the body. And this seems kind of obvious. You say, well, if you find an animal that's got, that has hollow bones and feathers, then it's probably flu, right? It, you can sort of surmise certain things. Or if it has, you know, webbed toes and a thick layer of fat, then it's, you know, something that lived in cold water. Um, similarly, you can look at the human body and surmise a great deal of information about our sexual behavior in prehistory from that. Well, what we found is that all these different uh, sources of information point to the same thing. Um, so while it's true that there is no direct evidence, there's sort of a truism in, in archaeology that social behavior doesn't leave artifacts, right? Um, so there are no artifacts of the way people interacted with, e with each other. But when you've got your four principal sources of information that all point to the same thing, then you can probably be pretty um, comfortable concluding that you've, that you've arrived at a, at a solid conclusion. The conclusion is that our ancestors lived in, um, in societies in which sexuality functioned primarily as a bonding device not primarily for reproduction. In fact, reproduction is a, a byproduct of human sexuality. Uh, you, can, you can figure this out just looking at numbers. How many times does the average human being have sex per birth? It's about a thousand to one, all right? Look at gorillas, which are a harem-based mating system. It's about 10 to 15 to one. So a gorilla only has sex 15 times at the most. The luckiest gorilla, the horniest gorilla, 15 times per birth, right? Humans before uh, contraception, I'm talking about our, our prehistoric ancestors as well as modern humans, about a thousand to one. So that tells you something about uh, the efficiency of human sexuality if its purpose were actually reproduction. So obviously it isn't. The purpose of human sexuality, what we argue in Sex at Dawn, is the establishment and maintenance of complex social groups which when you think about human beings, that's what we do best. That's what we're good at. We're not particularly fast runners or fearsome fighters or, 
you know, great climbers or any skill you want to name, we're not really very good at it. What we're good at is getting together and forming these complex social units. And these, the societies that we form, the social groups that we form, are what evolve over time and what have given us so much power uh, where at this point we're dominating the planet and suffocating it under our own weight. So that's what we're good at. And sexuality, until the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago, functioned to, to keep these groups cohesive. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, functioning well and, and uh, minimizing conflict within the group. And how does sexuality do that? I think of, you know, you could, you could make an opposite case maybe that sexuality seems to cause a lot of uh, uh, mm -hmm. competition between people sure. and war it, and it does now. have fallen and wars have been begun. <laughs> right, right. Um, Okay, first of all, it's very important to understand that when you talk about uh, human evolution, when you're talking in these sort of time frames that we're talking about, uh, anatomically modern human beings developed between 150 and 200,000 years ago. Sci scientists have different opinions about this, but nobody you know, really knows. But let's say uh, 200,000 years ago, uh, anatomically modern humans they looked like us, they had the same brain capacity we do. They, you know, uh, if, if a 200,000 year old uh, human being from 200,000 years ago walked down the street, you wouldn't notice the difference, okay? So we're talking about people with our cognitive capacity. Agriculture came on the scene at the earliest 10,000 years ago. That's 5% of our existence as a modern species. We're not even talking about Cro-Magnons and earlier uh, manifestations of the human line. Um, so, post-agricultural history, while it seems to a normal person like a very long time, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, the Egyptians, seems like a very long time, in fact, it's a small sliver of our existence as a species. So, if you want to understand human beings, it's important to look at that 95% of our existence in which we lived in consistent social groups, in nomadic hunter-gatherer groups that are, have certain universal qualities wherever you find them in the world. So that's an important data point to keep in mind. Uh, as far as conflict, sexuality causes conflict in societies in which sexual partners are seen as property, right? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Read that in context in the Old Testament, and what you find is it says, nor his house, nor his she-ass, nor his ox, nor his servants. In other words, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff. It has nothing to do with respecting his relationship. It's about respecting his property, okay? So with the advent of agriculture, the concept of private property entered the, the cognitive lexicon of our species. Before that, people are nomadic. They had to carry everything they had with them everywhere they went. So there's no, and you're, and you're moving constantly about 10 kilometers a day on average, right? So you don't want to schlep around a lot of stuff. There's no need to schlep around a lot of stuff because what you do is you share stuff. Right? It made more sense to share stuff. Not because people were necessarily more altruistic, simply because it was a more efficient way of living. There's no need to carry around 15 cooking pots for each nuclear family in your group if you could carry around two or three and share them. Right? Similarly, what we call the standard narrative in, in our book, which is the, the story that we all know, which is Men, since time immemorial, have um, controlled female sexuality because they wanted to assure their paternity, that this has been very important to the human male uh, forever because we want to make sure that it's my DNA that's going into the future. I'm not investing all of my resources in the child of another man, right? So it's a very economic view of, of human sexual interaction. But in a society in which there's no private property, who cares whose child came from which union? There's no reason to care because you're not leaving your farm and your animals and your house and all this stuff to your child. You don't have a farm or animals or a house. You don't have anything except your wisdom and your, you know, your spiritual essence. And that can pass to whomever. So what you find in hunter-gatherer groups is they generally don't really give a damn about biological fatherhood. In fact, there are many societies in the Amazon uh, that practice what anthropologists call partable paternity, which means that they believe that babies can have multiple fathers. 
biologically, not in an adoption kind of sense, but biologically. And this is believed by societies that have had no contact with one another, no common language in very disparate parts of the, of the Amazon. There are also tribes in Papua New Guinea that, that believe this. So it's um, uh, quite likely that this was very widespread around the world, that this is a conclusion people come to readily. So the idea is that when uh, a girl starts to menstruate, she's a little pregnant, but she won't sort of reach a tipping point and actually start to form a fetus until she's accumulated a certain amount of semen, right? So because the fetus is literally made of semen. So what she'll do, because like mothers everywhere, she wants to have the smartest, funniest, strongest kid she can, she'll have sex with the funny guy and the strong guy and the guy who's a good hunter and the most intelligent guy to get the essence of all these different men into her baby. And then when the child's born, these different men will come forward and say, yes, I'm a father, yes, I'm a father. So fatherhood's a team enterprise with these people, right? So the idea that one sexual encounter can result in a child isn't even universally understood. Even Darwin didn't understand that one sperm cell was enough to fertilize an egg and create a human being. What we call the standard model of human sexual evolution is this story we've all, we're all familiar with that um, men have always traded something to women in exchange for their sexual fidelity. So the, the idea in prehistory is that they were trading meat and uh, shelter and protection and status and so on. And in exchange, the woman promises. Ah, oh, that's the jet. It's probably that. Yeah, keep rolling. That's a hell of a printer. I know. Is that architectural? <laughs> no, it's uh, just for large photos. Oh, wow. OK, go on. Uh, so, the, so the idea is that uh, since the beginning of, of time, our ancestors have had this sort of um, deal between the men and the women. And the deal was that the men provided uh, meat and status and protection and shelter and so on to the women in exchange for their sexual fidelity so that the men could be assured of their paternity because it's a tragedy to invest all your resources in the, uh, the genetic legacy of another man, right? Um, that's why we say in the book that Darwin says your mother's a whore, right? We don't. We say your mother's sort of a slut in a good way. We mean that in a positive sense. Your mother has sex. Every woman, women have sex because sex is good. Se women enjoy sex. Same reason men have sex. Um, there's not this ulterior motive. It's not always they're having sex in exchange for something, you know, that they can get out of the deal. So there's this sort of you know, primordial gold digger view of women that's baked into the, this neo-Darwinian understanding of human sexual evolution. What we're saying is, no, people have sex because it feels good, because it creates intimacy, because it, it develops trust. All these things that are essential to the functioning of a small scale, highly intimate, nomadic band of hunter-gatherers. Um, so we find all these examples of hunter-gatherer societies in which, um, first of all, um, one thing that is universal to immediate return hunter-gatherers is what anthropologists call fierce egalitarianism, which means nobody can tell anyone else what to do. So we, what happens is that we look at prehistory through the lens of the current day. So we sort of look around us, assume these conditions are universal to our species, and then project them back into prehistory as a way of both trying to understand the present, but also as a way of justifying the present, even if we're doing it subconsciously. Uh, in our book, we call this process Flintstoneization, right? So you sort of look around, you look at prehistory and say, well, they must have been just like us, just a little more primitive. So they you know, had cars that they had to push with their feet and you know, all this silliness. And we sort of have done the same thing in, uh, in terms of anthropology and our understanding of sexuality. So Darwin, who never had sex with anyone until he was 30, almost 30, he was late uh, 29, almost 30, when he married his first cousin, who was a famously un unsexual person, a real prude. She was from the Wedgwood China family. Um, you know, so Darwin sort of applied this very Victorian vision of sexuality 
uh, to e the evolutionary process. Uh, if Darwin were alive today, we believe he'd be the first to reconfigure his theories in light of data he didn't have access to. You know, Darwin didn't know that bonobos existed, for example. Uh, he, he had very little access to primatological data that we have now. All the different uh, anatomical um, factors that, that we'll talk about, he had no knowledge of those things. But Darwin was extremely focused on data. He was very data driven. He wrote l thousands of letters to people traveling all over the world uh, asking them to, you know, make sure you pay attention to this and collect this specimen if you can. And what did you notice about that particular tribe that you were with? And he, he was always interested in revising his theories in light of new information. He was a great scientist. So nothing that we say in the book or that I say here is meant as a criticism of Darwin as a man. But having said that, he had bias. Just as I have bias and you have bias, everyone has bias. And... Um, to his credit, he tried to see his bias, but you know, none of us can see our eyes, right? None of us can taste our mouths. It's impossible. So Darwin was coming from a very repressive Victorian society, and he was a gentleman. He was very upper class. He felt a lot of the, the restrictions of his society. And there was also an interesting uh, biographical element to it because Darwin's grandfather Erasmus was a famous libertine, a poet who wrote about group sex among flowers but he was obviously talking about orgies, you know, human orgies. He had children with several different women, never tried to to hide it. When his wife died he uh, shacked up with the maid and lived openly with her for, for years. So, his, so there was sort of a family shame, I think, about the crazy, you know, libertine grandfather that may have been reflected in Darwin's uh, repressive nature. And then, of course, Darwin famously suffered from all sorts of uh, probably uh, psychosomatic illnesses throughout his life, including extreme anxiety, explosive farting, which is why he, he was afraid to speak publicly, uh, yeah, crying fits. Uh, you know, sleeplessness, nausea, vomiting, he was, he was a mess. Uh, his mother died when he was, I think, eight years old. And um, so there are all sorts of interesting Freudian theories about Darwin's sexual repress, repression and so on. And his daughter, Eddie, who um, edited his books, went through and with a red crayon crossed out any reference to any sort of human sexual behavior from his books. Later, she grew up to be a psychotic prude. She did this thing where there were these mushrooms that grew in the forest around their house. She would, so when the mushrooms came up, they looked like penises. It's called phallus ravenensi or something in, in Latin. They looked like human penises. And so when they would sprout, she would lock up all the maids and go out with her special mushroom stick and gloves and a bag and get all these phalluses for phalli from the forest and then take them home and lock herself in her room and burn them in the fireplace so that none of the maids would be corrupted by seeing these penile objects growing in the woods. Anyway, the point is the Darwins were a special bunch, you know, and Charles was a very special guy. So churches across the country um, rented cinemas to take their congregation to see this film, March of the Penguins, because it was such a wonderful example of monogamy and, you know, how natural that is and how important it is. Um, now, unfortunately, the film's about emperor penguins. Emperor penguins live into their 30s. Their sexual life begins at about 10, I believe. And what they don't mention in the film or in the congregations is that those penguins take a new mate every season. So your typical emperor penguin has 20 or 25 sexual partners, mates in its lifetime. And yet this is held up as an example of monogamy occurring in nature. It's, it's ridiculous. Or, or they talk about prairie voles, prairie voles. I mean, let's talk about primates, okay? If, if you wanna understand y your dog's behavior, 
Where are you going to look? You're going to look at wolves, foxes, coyotes. You're not going to look at swans and ducks and, you know, you know, it's ridiculous. And that's what we're doing. We're so desperate to find examples, corollaries of monogamous behavior that we look anywhere we can find it, from prairie voles to swans, and even those turn out not to be monogamous. Because what, since the advent of DNA testing, what biologists have found is that the vast majority of the species thought to have been monogamous are only socially monogamous, not sexually monogamous. So they might form a couple that takes care of the nest or the young or whatever, um, but that male is not the biological father of those chicks or those young of whatever species it is. So it's sort of a desperate search. I, I mean, I see it almost as a pre-Copernican insistence that the Earth has to be at the center of the solar system. It just has to be. And all this evidence pointing uh, in another direction be damned, you know. But the point is, the evidence does point in another direction. There are over 300 species of primate, many of which live in complex social groups with more than one male. How many of those species are monogamous? Goose egg, not one, not one, unless you think we're the sole exception, right? So this, the standard model presumes that human beings evolved in nuclear families, like some sort of prehistoric suburbia, where it was mom, dad, you know, leave it to, to you know, prehistoric beaver. It, it's ridiculous. In fact, if a man comes home in a hunter-gatherer society having killed a deer and says, okay, I've got this deer here. I'm going to only share this food with my woman and our children. Fuck the rest of you. What happens is that guy gets kicked out of the group. It turns out that in these fiercely egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies, no matter where you find them in the world, from the Inuit in Alaska to uh, Australian outback to the Amazon, Papua New Guinea, one thing they all have in common is that sharing is the central organizing motif of their society. Again, not because of any sort of noble savage silliness, simply because when you live in this sort of a society and that sort of environment, Sharing is the best way of mitigating risk. It's no more noble than it is when we pay our insurance premiums or our taxes or whatever. This is all just a way of mitigating risk. You spread it out through the society. Today I shot something, tomorrow you may and I won't. You don't get something every day you go hunting. And anyway, even if I did, I still need you to protect my kids when I'm not here and you need me to protect your kids and we're all in this together. That's the essential human condition. That's what changed with the advent of agriculture. So again, it's important to understand where we lived for 95% of our time on this planet and how we lived and how we inter interrelated um, because that doesn't necessarily tell us the right ways to do things, but it does tell us what comes naturally to us. It tells us what fits comfortably. So. I often say our book isn't an argument against monogamy. Nothing I'm saying here is meant to, to be critical of monogamy. What I mean to be critical of is hypocrisy and ignorance that tells people that monogamy comes naturally to you, so it should be easy. So if you love your wife, you'll never want to have sex with anyone else. Any man alive knows that's bullshit, right? And if you love your husband, you'll never think about another man. Come on. So what happens? People blame themselves, they blame their partner, they, they think the marriage is dysfunctional. It creates a huge amount of suffering because the expectations are all wrong, right? Our sense of what comes naturally to us is wrong. So I say monogamy is like vegetarianism. It can be ethical, it can be healthy, it can be a great decision in so many different ways. It can be a great way to live. But the fact that you've decided to be a vegetarian doesn't mean bacon stops smelling good suddenly. Right? And if you beat yourself up every time the barbecue smells good and you think you're a failure, you're less likely to continue with your vegetarianism. This is something Dan Savage talks about a lot. More flexibility in our marriages makes them more stable. It makes them last longer. We're willing and able to share things with each other. We're, we're willing to talk about the truth with this person we're supposedly sharing our lives with. If you can't talk about the truth, your relationship is screwed. Uh, 
Uh, Chris Ryan, take six, I think. Oh, oh, the sound. You need the sound. I see. That's why they click it. Oh, okay. I've never understood why they do that. On the audio, on his audio, we could just look for the little peak in the. Oh, and I was doing this. That's not helping. I thought it was just visual. Oh, sorry, sorry. All right. Um, yeah, take six. Now, if, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, the naturalistic fallacy, I think it's a naturalistic fallacy to look at these distant species to try to justify whatever it is you've chosen to justify or understand in human behavior. If you're going to do this at all, do it with the species that are most closely related to human beings, right? As I said, if you want to understand your dog, you don't go study ducks or seals. You look at wolves and coyotes and foxes. Um, so similarly, if you want to understand human behavior and you're going to look for the, prime, the, the biological basis of this behavior, look at chimps and bonobos. Chimps and bonobos, the best way to think about chimps and bonobos for me is like I've got twin brothers. I'm equally related to both of them. They're more closely related to each other than they are to me, but I'm the closest after, you know, the other one. And then we've got a cousin who's a gorilla, and then we've got another cousin who's an orangutan, a more distant cousin, and then a further cousin, the gibbon, and those are the apes, okay? Apes are just primates without tails. That's the difference between apes and monkeys. Most people don't know that. Um, so, the, the, so, so the gorillas are more distantly related to uh, bonobos and chimps than bonobos and chimps are to us. If you go to a zoo and you see a chimp in a cage, that chimp is more closely related to you than it is to anything else in the zoo. Right? We're very, we're more closely related to chimps and bonobos than the Indian elephant is to the African elephant. Right? So it's a very, very tight, um, uh, the three of us, chimps, bonobos, humans, are very closely related. Okay, so what do we find? We find that everybody writing about the primordial origins of human violence, of, you know, raping women and infanticide and all these horrible things talks about chimpanzees because chimpanzees are nasty fuckers. They do all sorts of things. They have war between groups. They rape, they murder, they kill the babies. They, they can get really out of hand. They're not always like that, but if they get crazy, they get crazy. Bonobos, which you rarely hear about, most people don't even know what a bonobo is, are exactly the opposite. In about 40 years now uh, that people have been studying bonobos in the wild and in captivity, there has never been a single observed instance of a bonobo raping or killing another bonobo. No warfare between groups, no raping of females, no hurting babies. They're incredibly peaceful. They're also incredibly sexual, which is why we don't hear about them. A, they completely disrupt the, the vision of human uh, prehistory that's being sold to us for all sorts of interesting political reasons, I believe. And secondly, they embarrass the prudes among us. So we just ignore that information, right? Bonobos, Franz Duval, who's the, the, probably the world's leading expert on bonobos and chimpanzees, uh, other than Jane Goodall, um, said that chimpanzees use violence to get sex. Bonobos use sex to avoid violence. Very interesting. So these two twin brothers of ours, one of them's the chimp. He's in prison. Right? He's a mass murderer, uh, you know, gangbanger. The other one is working in you know, India, you know, attending to the poor, and, you know, but we never hear about that one, right? So we just say, oh, he's from a bad family. His brother's in prison. What about the other brother? Come on. So bonobos, completely peaceful. If you throw a bunch of food into a, an enclosure full of chimps, all hell breaks loose. The, the alpha male and his coalition will take control of the food and maybe they'll share a little with a female if she happens to be ovulating because they're only interested in the females when they're ovulating. Um, otherwise, they'll just eat the food and they'll, they'll fight off anyone else who gets near them. If you throw a packet of food into an enclosure of bonobos, they'll all fuck and then they'll share the food, right? Completely different response to stress because the sudden presence of the food is stressful. So they deal with stress by having sex with each other. They have sex in every combination except mother-son. 
And the mother-son relationship is, is probably the most important relationship in bonobo uh, troops. In fact, the, the male's um, uh, position in the, in the hierarchy, in the male hierarchy, is dependent upon where his mother was in the female hierarchy. It's not dependent on how badass he is. It depends on how much his mother was loved and respected. Because the female hierarchy is all about respect. It's not about fighting and coercive force. So it's, this sounds very Rousseauian, very hippy-dippy bullshit, but it's not. This is, this is the way they live, and they are equally relevant to any discussion of human prehistory as chimps are. So I think it's very unfortunate and scientifically criminal when people mention chimpanzees in their discussions of human prehistory as a way to, to prove that we are a warlike species, that we're aggressive, that we, it's natural that we rape women and so on. There was a book you know, arguing this, evolutionary psychologists often argue this very conservative political view of our, of our origins, of our biology. And they don't mention the counterexample, which is biologically just as relevant. It's ridiculous to me. It's, it's talking about the day sky and forgetting the night sky. Is it possible that conservatives descended from chimps and the folks descended from bonobos? <laughs> but you want to ask something. But doesn't that also, the example of the bonobos is a thing, I mean that, you know, uh, incest and pedophilia is, is, is perhaps inherent to humans or? Uh, possibly, or not in incest, not so much. Oh, I, I should continue with that thing about the, yeah. So, so it's true, the bonobos have sexual interactions between everybody of any age. Uh, homosexual interactions as well, what we would call homo same-sex interactions. Uh, in fact, one of the most common um, sexual interactions is between two females. Um, primatologists call it GG rubbing, G being genitalia. And what happens is the two females sort of back up to each other uh, and rub their clitoris together, like just a quick. So it's not that every sexual uh, encounter results in orgasm. In fact, one author refers to these as a bonobo handshake. It's just, uh, hey, how you doing? You know, it's like grooming behavior. It's 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 all about you know uh, developing social relationships is really what it's about. Um, as I said, the only combination that never happens is mother-son, which makes me think that motherfucker is the oldest possible uh, insult, you know. Uh, goes all six million years back to our last common ancestor. Um, but the reason, the way both chimps and bonobos avoid incest is that when the females become uh, sexually mature, they leave their, the group that they were born into and go and join another group. In other, it's known as a female exogamous society. The data are not clear as to humans, but it seems from recent genetic uh, research that uh, most prehistoric human societies were also female exogamous, which, meant that, which means, again, that the sexually mature female leaves the group she was born into. Um, no, th there's definitely a biological component to this. I'm tempted to look at you when I'm talking. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, no, you say wherever you want. I'm, I'm, I'm used to looking at you at this point. Um, there's definitely a biological component uh, to this. You know, the simple fact that a woman can get pregnant and spend nine months being very vulnerable and Roshan, then... Sorry, sorry, back yeah. that up in Roshan's bed. Take, lean to your left a little, you're in the right hand. You don't have to sit here. I'm, I'm used to looking at him. It's just okay. the, yeah, with this particular yeah. question because we were talking. That's, that's okay. fine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think the... the say that again about yeah, the yeah, the, there's definitely a biological component uh, to, to these differences in male and female sexual response. No, no question about it. Um, there's a great research, piece of research, very simple. They, uh, they got uh, uh, lesbians, straight women, self-identified straight women, um, straight men, gay men. Gave them all testosterone shots, right? And then showed them various photos of, of different sexual uh, scenarios. So what happened? The gay men became more uh, focused on men. Straight men became more focused on women. Uh, lesbians became more focused on women. And the straight women became more focused on everybody. They were more responsive to every sort of stimulation. Uh, Meredith Chivers did this work, I believe. 
Um, you also have uh, very interesting research where they, they had a series of different types of uh, sexual stimuli, different uh, videos. There was, uh, you know, heterosexual uh, porn, gay, gay male porn, uh, woman on woman porn, uh, 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 attractive man walking down the beach, an attractive woman working out in the gym, and bonobos, just to throw in a real ringer, bonobos having sex. And so they hooked people up to um, uh, a, a device that measures genital blood flow. There's a thing that goes around the penis, it can tell if it's swelling, and there's a thing that goes inside the vagina that can tell if the blood flow increases to the vagina. Um, and then they also had uh, a dial on the table where they would uh, indicate how turned on they were when they saw these different scenarios on the video. So what they found was that the men, both gay and straight, were turned on by what you would think they were turned on by, and they indicated, what they indicated with the dial matched up with what their genital blood flow said. And the lesbians were the same as the men, but the straight women were turned on by every one of those different scenarios, according to the genital blood flow. But they only indicated the ones you would expect, the sort of, you know, culturally acceptable ones. So there, there's evidence that goes beyond cultural, that there are deep biological differences uh, in men and women, and also between lesbians and straight women yeah, in their responsiveness. Yeah, of course, I mean, of course, culture affects biology in those ways, sure. right? I mean, if, if, but I, well, I well, well but that's the point, that's the point, that, that, and this gets back to your question, that these women didn't even know what was turning them on. Why not? Because the culture's been telling them for thousands of years, you're not feeling this right? 19th century women, they went to doctors. The number one reason for a woman to go to a doctor in the U.S. and England at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was for treatment of hysteria. What were the symptoms of hysteria? Sleeplessness, moodiness, uh, overall body pains, you know, typical what we call today fibromyalgia in, in many cases. So how was it treated? The doctors massaged them, two fingers inside, the hand outside, and provoked what they called a nervous paroxysm, okay? This is in all the medical journals from the late 19th century. They're talking about the technique. In fact, one doctor says it's like that game where you pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time. Like that's the, and they complain about how difficult it is and how much their shoulders ached at the end of the day. They have women lined up. It's the perfect disease. Nobody dies and nobody gets better. So they just keep coming back for more treatments. So these doctors are thinking, you know, I wish I could treat more than one woman at a time. I'd make a fortune, right? So this is late 19th century, the age of industrialization. They get together with some other people and they come up with a machine that can do this. They've got steamed powered vibrators hanging on from chains from the rafters. That, you know, they've got tables with pistons coming through the table. They've got high pressure water where they'll strap a woman into a chair in the corner and spray a fire hose at her. They've got all these contraptions. There's a wonderful book called The Technology of Orgasm by Rachel Maines where she traces the development of all these things. So of course there are huge cultural uh, barriers to women uh, expressing or even experiencing their sexual um, lives. Doctors were uh, cutting out girls' clitorises to stop them from masturbating. The most famous doctor in the United States and in England was um, recommending the application of carbolic acid to the clitoris of little girls who, who masturbated too much. The same guy, Kellogg, of the Kellogg family of the, you know, all the foods, um, recommended sewing the foreskin together with wire to stop boys from getting erections which would make them uh, touch themselves inappropriately. So there's a real demonic hatred of sexual response, especially in kids. I and mean, people don't know this, cornflakes were developed to stop boys from masturbating graham crackers, all these foods were about stopping boys from masturbating because the idea was that any food with an interesting flavor made 13 year old boys horny. So let's give them the most bland food we can possibly come up with and that'll dampen down the fires, you know, the sinful fires within them. Didn't work.
So um, uh, real quick before we close here, because we're going to run out of cards here. Um, I was wondering, I had this intuition uh, that I don't know if you agree with, but it seems like the, these kind of free agricultural nomadic societies are resonating with us like for the first time since agriculture, uh, because we, we the, the advent, ironically, the, the advent of technology has made us again into these less boundary defined beings, you know? And uh, so we are, you know, it used to be you were tied to this farm and this place and this family, and now you can meet thousands of people on Facebook, you can travel around the world with great ease, you can have, you know, not everyone obviously. Mm. And uh, it seems like we're maybe returning to uh, at least some elements of this pre-agricultural existence. Do you think that there's anything to that? Yeah, I think the modern primitive, I think there is something to that. And I think another impetus in that is the bankruptcy of modern civilization. Arthur Miller, the playwright, said that an era can be considered over when its basic illusions have been exhausted. And I think we live in a moment where a lot of our basic illusions are exhausted. We've exhausted the illusion that we're being governed by people who are doing it for the benefit of society as opposed to their own benefit. We've exhausted the illusion that bankers are conservative, low-risk businessmen who are just there to facilitate the functioning of the economy as opposed to pirates, which is what they've been exposed as. You know, we've, be, we've uh, exhausted the illusion that pharmaceutical companies are, are interested in human health as opposed to profit. And I think similarly, we're witnessing the exhaustion of the illusion that love and monogamy are the same thing. And people are seeing that uh, there are other ways to configure families. There are other ways to configure emotional relationships than just the standard um, issue relationship that the, the you know we, we've lost the illusion that uh, the church is any closer to God than anyone else in fact a lot of them seem further from God than your normal person walking down the street with the pedophile uh, cases in the Catholic Church and so on so I think we're, we're at a turning point and I think that what's happening is that people are saying okay this isn't working what works what can work we need to we need to figure out a new way forward so in order to know, in order to find a path forward, I think it helps to look backwards. It helps to look at history, right? He who doesn't understand history is condemned to repeat it. What about he who doesn't understand prehistory? What's he condemned to repeat? The same mistakes over and over and over again. So I don't think that prehistory gives us the key to anything. I don't think it's a, a magical solution. But I do think that when you look at, you know, the United States, What's the number one drug prescribed in the United States? Antidepressants. Why? Why are so many people depressed? Because modern life is unfulfilling, right? What, what are the, the major diseases? Uh, diabetes, obesity. Why? Because people aren't moving the way our ancestors moved. Low impact, uh, high frequency aerobic exercise. The body has a design. People who say, oh, we should overcome nature, you know, uh, uh, the African queen, nature, Mr. Albright, all nut is what we're put here to rise above. Bullshit. You're not going to rise above nature. You're not an angel. You're an animal. You're an ape, just like everybody else. Deal with it. You shit, you eat, you sweat, you sleep. Come on, wake up, right? So when we start treating each other and ourselves as if we're not animals, as if we've got a choice in the matter, that's when we get all messed up. That's when we make mistakes. That's when we hurt each other and ourselves. So I'm not saying we're just animals, but we are animals. So when, you, when your diet is Coca-Cola and chili dogs, you're gonna have health problems because your body isn't fooled by that. Your body knows what the natural diet for that body is. And you're not gonna fool it over the long term. And I think it's the same with other aspects of life as well. Now, one last question. It seems like on, on, if we're optimistic, we could be, uh, you know, reaching a, 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 a shift for the reasons you've outlined, and we're considering things that are better. But there's there's another possible interpretation, which is a little more uh, pessimistic, but possible, uh, that we're going ever towards more and more commodification 
of everything, including yeah. each other, right. and including our sexuality, and all right. of our needs need to be met. And I, now I'm horny, and now I want to fuck this, and I want to do this, and I, you know, and, and it all has to be available to me now. Yeah. And and marriage could be seen, uh, and monogamy and commitment of that kind could be seen as this one last island of the sacred, you know, in a time when none of these things have a hold on us anymore, whether right. it's religion or right. you know all these other kinds of practices. And I think a lot of people are finding meaning, and maybe too much. Maybe a lot of people that we've talked have said like it's too much burden for one thing to take. But should we still maybe like not give up on the idea of having something that's transcendental in this age? Sure. Of commodification, endless commodification. Exactly. That's why I say it's like vegetarianism. If if that's your thing, if if you decide, you know, if your spiritual ethical uh, value in life is located in your monogamous marriage, then good for you. My parents have been married 52 years. They're, 50th anniversary was a month after our book came out, you know? And as far as I know, they've been pretty damn happy every one of those years. And monogamous. And mom and dad, if you see this, I don't want to hear about it if you weren't, you know? But uh, the, of, of course that can be very important. Just like I, I wouldn't argue against someone following a spiritual path, or I wouldn't say you're wrong to have kids, even though obviously overpopulation is a major problem, right? Um, if you approach something with that perspective, if you say, look, this is meaningful, this is important, this is something we've agreed to, that's great. As long as you agree to that in the knowledge of what you're doing, in the knowledge that this is going to be hard, you know, unless you're both at that end of the spectrum, you know, very low libido, you know, sexual variety is not important to either one of you, fine. But for the typical man and typical woman, a lifetime with one sexual partner is going to be challenging. So I'm not saying it's a bad idea to choose that path. I'm saying understand it's an uphill path. Understand it's not going to be a breeze. And understand that when you have challenges, that when you notice her checking out another guy or she notices you checking out a woman, don't take that as a failure. Don't take that as an indictment of your relationship. Take that as a completely natural behavior and share that, right? Share it, enjoy it together. Hey, she's hot, yeah, she's hot, great. That's much better and it's much easier to live with and your relationship is much more likely to, to last the long term if you can talk about this stuff, right? If you start with the, the, the fallacy that monogamy and love are the same thing, you're in big trouble because you're expecting this to be a, a downhill stroll and it's gonna be a climb. And that makes it much harder for people. And do you think we're moving towards a time where now that people can be having these conversations and marriage and monogamy can be defined in new I ways? Do. I do. I do. Be successful? Or? Yeah, and I think it's because of people like you making this film. I think it's people like Dan Savage who have been talking about this stuff. You know, you think about Dan Savage. He is the most read sex advice columnist in North America. He's got no academic qualifications at all. He's a gay man giving advice to a largely heterosexual audience. The only thing he's brought are, is great intelligence, great sense of humor, and great honesty, right? And when I started reading Dan Savage a long time ago, his column was called Hey Faggot, right? It was in The Onion. And what's happened? He's now mainstream. He's on the Colbert Report all the time. He's on Bill Maher and HBO. He's uh, profiled in the New York Times. He hasn't changed. The mainstream has moved to him, right? So I think he's a historical figure, and I think that, that he is a very important figure in helping move the conversation in a much more rational direction, in a much more comprehensive and, and, and informed direction. That, you know, we, we see different waves sort of washing through. We've got the human rights. Uh, waves, the women's rights, the, the you know civil rights with blacks, and all these different waves washing through, and the gay rights wave is washing through even as we speak. And I think soon the next gay will be non-monogamous people, that they'll stand up as some of them already are and say, hey, I'm not monogamous, right? No, that's not a criticism of anyone else. It's just me, George Clooney. I'm not. Why aren't you getting married, George? I'm not monogamous, and I don't want to lie to anybody. Beautiful. It's true. That's all we're arguing for in the book. I think that's all anyone should argue for.